As clever as we humans think we are, we only have a snapshot of time to evaluate geological history on this planet. Recorded human history is only some six or seven thousand years old if you don't count burnt stick drawings of animals on cave walls. There are discoveries in the Arctic, as well as the tropics, as well as in the stars of our galaxy over the last few centuries that point to a more difficult to accept and likely very different history of the end of many of the species that occurred 12,000 years ago. 500 BC China was dinging mastodon tusks out of the Siberian frozen tundra. By 1799, mastodon tusk ivory was being sold around the world, and in the last 40 years, more of the remains of these extinct animals have been recovered in the Klondike, northern Alaska, and in Siberia, all date from 12,000 years ago, and all exhumed from a frozen muck that holds a disarticulated mishmash immediately frozen, and when we unearthed it today, it was as if it was frozen yesterday. Coincidental, this 12,000 year cycle is one within our galaxy. There are nova gas clouds at 12,000 light years away, 24,000 light years away, 36,000 light years away, 48,000 light years away, and that pattern goes on at a 12,000 light year distance increment. A seeming repeating pattern of stellar nova occurrences. We also know now that there are several sun sized stars that have repeating nova events in tens and hundreds of year cycles. There may be longer cycles, but we have not been around long enough to see them. But it is safe to assume that our star may also do this. And if this is the explanation of the phenomenon describing the evidence we see, then we may be very near another one of these events. On one morning 12,000 years ago, some of the now extinct animals of North America were attracted to the animals caught in the tar in the La Brea tar pit in what is now Los Angeles. Ancient equines, giant wolves, short-faced bears, saber-toothed tigers, woolly mammoths. These same ancient animals were also in Siberia along with vast herds of mastodons roaming the length of the Siberian tundra when something in the sky caught their eye. 93 million miles away, the sun suddenly flashed at a thousand times brighter than normal for over a minute. And all these ancient animals saw their world end instantly in a single violent moment as the sun went over and sent out a dust shell at 1550 miles per second that slammed into the earth for another cycle of renewal. Twelve thousand years later, we are uncovering the result of that last day. Scientists are finding broken animals all over the northern continents. Whole animals, but they're all shattered inside. When the bodies are unfrozen, the brains are intact and the muscles are red and the meat is not rotten. Twelve thousand years ago, something happened along the shorelines of the tropics. On the western shore of Florida are shell pits. I'm standing here in one of the shell pits in Putagorda, Florida, 30 miles inland from the coast. This deep horizon of shells appears to be in three layers, but all layers contain the same types of shells, as if deposited, burnt, and then turned back over themselves. Saber-toothed tiger teeth, bones of mastodons were also found in these shell pits, as well as one south of Tampa. Between the upper and lower layer is a five-inch layer of burnt shells. Shell, calcium carbonate, burns at 820 degrees centigrade, or 1508 degrees Fahrenheit. What could provide the temperature all over the surface of shells exposed to such great heat all at once? And how did this get where it is? The answer is under the ocean and what happens when these events take place during a magnetic field reversal. There is surely an unexplained phenomenon below the surface of the sea that has not been reasonably explained. All over the world, off of every coast, the topography of the continental shelves have huge vertical erosion characteristics that are identical to land-based mountain ranges and rock cut by waterfalls. Enormous erosional cuts into the side walls of the continental shelves and massive channels that end up with alluvial plains at the bottom of the ocean floor are exactly like the channels cut into mountains from rain and rivers on land that end up in alluvial deposits at the end of rivers. Assuming the undersea topography is from freshwater rivers emptying into the oceans and cutting into the walls of the continental shelf as the rivers flow into the oceans is a perfect example that the more assumptions you have to make, 
the more unlikely an explanation is correct. Not the least of which is ignoring the fact that salt water is denser than fresh water. Therefore, fresh water cannot physically descend below salt water to cut channels into anything. Clearly, the problem of explaining the ocean topography as the same as the land-based erosion topography is the problem of providing a reason that somehow the oceans have been emptied and another massive source of water is pouring over the ledge of the continental shelf into an empty ocean basin. As preposterous as that seems, there is a way, albeit briefly and repeatedly, that this might occur. A reasonable answer can be provided, but the explanation is complex because it involves the magnetic connection between the sun's magnetic field and the earth's magnetic field. So follow along. It will take time to present the newest evidence to grasp their implications leading to the answer. Recently, it was discovered that deep inside the earth around the magnetic iron and nickel of the core is a 1 to 10 kilometer thick electrically conductive ultra low viscosity zone at the earth's core to mantle boundary. 90% of the mantle's iron monoxide is concentrated at the lowest region of the mantle next to the core and has a dielectric capacitance. Electrical conductivity measurements in the iron plus 3 atoms found in the iron-containing magnesium aluminum silicate perovskite in the deep mantle show no drop in conductivity at that depth because the 330 gigapascals of pressure at that depth negates any Curie temperature effects. This opens up a completely new understanding of the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field can be explained by electromagnetic theory and a new theory of magnetism. Charles Proteus Steinmetz discovered that inductance in a coil is how well it can store electric energy in a magnetic field like at the Earth's core. The power of the magnet is the current times the voltage. When voltage is reduced, the magnetic field is transformed back into a dielectric field. When voltage is increased, the dielectricity is transformed into a magnetic field. The Earth has a capacitance to store a large dielectric field needed to produce the enormous geomagnetic field. According to Michael Faraday, when a magnetic field like the Earth's core is pulled through a conductor like the low viscosity layer of iron monoxide at the mantle core interface, an electric current flows in the conductor and that the current in the conductor will make a ring-shaped toroidal magnetic field with a flowing current. Ah, but where is the voltage to run this current coming from? At any given moment, the sun is pouring out highly charged plasma conducted outward along its magnetic field lines, the solar wind. Magnetic theory scientist Ken Wheeler, a student of Steinmetz, Faraday, and Nikola Tesla, has shown that all magnetic fields are a juxtaposition of two counter-rotating flows of inertial force created from a dielectric plane of inertia. There are no magnetic poles or attraction and repulsion, only pressure and counterpressure to and from the plane of inertia. There are centripetal vortex funnels at the top and bottom of the centrifugal magnetic field structure that in the case of the Earth naturally induct voltage towards the plane of inertia. He has clearly shown this phenomena to be evident in testing where a magnetic field is shown to have two counter-rotating commingled field flows flowing out of a region mid-center of the magnet in opposite directions as the combined dielectric inertial fields. One field flows back into one end of the magnet, and another flows into the opposite end of the magnet. A general magnetic field with two funnel-like cusps, where the auroras are directed, towards the plane of inertia. The entire geofield fills up with solar voltage. The magnetosphere multi-scale spacecraft has identified that as solar-charged particles reach the Earth, they fill the magnetosheath with a turbulent magnetic plasma that makes localized magnetic reconnections, not unlike the reconnections in the stretched lines in the antisolar direction of the magnetic field, or the reconnections of magnetic lines and solar flares. These generate spikes of voltage into the geomagnetic field. Inside the field are Birkeland currents that can carry between 100,000 and a million volts flowing along geomagnetic field lines connecting the solar wind caught in the Earth's magnetosphere to the Earth's high latitude ionosphere and funnel it into the polar regions, often seen as aurora. The Themis satellite revealed that power added to the magnetic field is 20 times higher than previously believed and traveling at nearly the speed of light. Mostly, it is a constant flow of plasma that is trapped in our geomagnetic field. The end mill spirals depict this flow of solar energy. This is the voltage to power the magnetic field. The Birkeland currents induct this energy from the field to the Earth in two pairs of field-aligned current sheets. One pair extends from noon through the dust sector to the midnight sector, where it flows back to the geomagnetic field. The other pair extends from midnight through the dawn sector to the noon sector, total coverage over 24 hours non-stop. The sheets on the high latitude side of the auroral zone is referred to as region 1 current sheets, and the sheets on the lower latitude side is referred to as region 2 current sheets. Voltage is constantly being inducted into the magnetic field in this way, but only recently understood. Mr. Wheeler's magnetic theory can therefore explain the coincidental locations of the Birkeland currents at the magnetic field poles and the voltage current induction. 
In this case, the dielectric field is at the center of the Earth. Because of this, the Earth's magnetic field has a dielectric capacitance that is maintained by the inductance of the Birkeland current into these magnetic structures. Solar charged particles caught in the geomagnetic field flow into the Birkeland current in the ionosphere and across the top of the Earth in the Patterson current and leave the Earth back into the geomagnetic field. The voltage of the current after the interaction is less leaving than it is coming because voltage is inducted into the Earth's core to maintain the magnetic field via the geomagnetic field centripetal vortex. This current of power is the key to both planetary geofield stability and rotation. The vortex spin of the centripetal field is the evidence that the dielectric plane of inertia rotates out of the dielectric. This rotating dielectric plane causes a rotating current flow in the magnetic toroid field of the Earth. This precession causes a torsional strain on the magnet or the mantle of the Earth, and the strain direction is transformed into rotation. As Steinmetz showed, when voltage is inducted, the geomagnetic flux is increased. Earth takes in just what it needs and rejects the rest to maintain the potential of the capacitance. According to electric theory, voltage is the electromotive force that causes a current to flow through a conductor having resistance. The conductor is the iron monoxide of the mantle. The resistance is the mantle rock. It is in this way the Earth's magnetic flux is under constant regeneration as voltage is inducted into the magnetic field in the core. As long as the sun pours out voltage, the Birkeland currents recharge the field. This trickle charge counteracts the frictional loss from rotation of the core inside the mantle, maintaining a stable rotational velocity and provides the magnetic precessional torque and subsequent planetary rotation. Simply, the Earth is a freely floating object in the solar magnetic gravity field under reduced external frictional loads and rotation is the natural outcome of the precessional torque. 24 hour rotation, 27,000 year axis precession, like a gyroscope. The mantle layer that is being induced to create the magnetic toroid is physically connected to the Earth. The field current direction is induced in the mantle as a transfer of energy from the momentum of the dielectric plane of inertia in the core inside the mantle. The induced centrifugal motion of the ring current is transformed into planetary rotation by lack of external frictional load. And in any motor induced by an electric current to rotate, if the current is interrupted, the rotation stops. And if the current is reversed, the rotation is reversed. And if we look at Earth's magnetic dynamo as an electric motor, where the magnet is inside the rotor windings attached to the motor casing, our planet rotates as long as the current is applied. And like any motor, if the current is interrupted, the rotation stops. And if the sun's current is interrupted, internal friction defeats the induced field current momentum and the Earth stops rotating. And this simple insight provides the means for explaining a situation, if only briefly, after a long cycle of normal rotation where the continental shelf is exposed for radical hydraulic action. When the solar voltage is interrupted, the Earth stops rotating, and the solar voltage can't stop if the Sun has a solar nova event. When the voltage stops, Earth stops rotating, but the oceans don't stop moving, and neither does the atmosphere. They move east at 800 miles per hour. The Atlantic Ocean translocates east, emptying the Atlantic Basin as it moves over Africa and Europe. The Indian Ocean translocates over Australia, the Pacific Ocean translocates across South America into the Amazon Basin and North America and pours over the continental shelves, transporting the shelves from the Gulf of Mexico seafloor over the Florida Peninsula in vast shell deposits, then pouring over the exposed face of the eastern continental shelves into an empty Atlantic Basin, carving and eroding the ledge. There is evidence that this happens during a 12,068-year repeating cycle caused by a recurring solar nova that is in synchronicity with other solar activity cycles the vote solar reset cycle. The next one is predicted at the end of the current 80-year wolf gleisberg cycle and an 11-year solar cycle ending in October 2047. When this happens, the sun suddenly flashes a thousand times brighter than normal, expending all its electrical energy in one burst, turning it off and stopping Earth's rotation until the solar dynamo can restart. Out in the galaxy there are voids where there are no galactic clusters, clusters that very likely had supernova that produced dust debris clouds that obscure their light. At 12, 24, 36, 48, and 60,000 light years away long ago in the past, like the ripples of a stone dropped into a calm lake spreading out where the crest of the waves lit up the night. Like our star did 12,000 years ago, along with all those stars 12, 24, 36, 48, and 60,000 years ago. 
lighting up the sky where they were at the same time as our star. The stone is about to drop again, and when it does, we actually may know how long the nova lasts. On October 8, 1604, 20,000 light years away from Earth, a supernova exploded. It started with a bright flash, and over the following three weeks it was visible during the day. So when our star goes nova, there will be an intense flash of light energy for maybe three weeks, enough to burn stones and kill millions of living beings, like all the broken apart animals and trees frozen into the melted tundra in the days following the nova 12,000 years ago. 12,000 years ago, in what would be Tanis, Egypt now, east-facing statues caught the rising sun as it went supernova over China. Brian Furrister has spent years investigating sites around the world, and he can describe what happened in Egypt in the morning on one very bad day. Now this is what's left of a quartzite statue, and you can see, as we get up close, that the surfaces were melted by some intense heat. This has been corroborated by geologists that we've had on location. Here's another statue. You see the left-hand side has been melted. And the greatest example are the Colossi of Memnon, especially this one on the left. The front surfaces are far more damaged than the sides or the back, so it appears that the solar pulse or plasma struck it from the east at sunrise. You see here the sides are not as badly damaged. Part of the arm has been ripped off of it. And you also notice the scorching marks of the heat. And again, the sides are relatively intact. We're now at Tanis, which is located in the Nile Delta of northern Egypt. And again, this is quartzite. And notice the powerful heat effect on the right-hand side. He has also seen what happened next as the Earth turned into the maelstrom of solar irradiance and it burnt the ground. Notice the color of the limestone tends to be kind of whitish, but the upper layers are yellow and even brown and black, as if heat had been applied in the distant past. Then as the Earth turned eastward, the temples of Egypt, Tionaku, and the heads of Easter Island were as the Nova Shell hit and were destroyed in violent earthquakes and massive floods. Just everything is broken on a massive scale. And we also see evidence of this at other locations, such as Karnak and the Ramesseum and other locations to the south. Every piece of stone at Tanis is broken, not through human intervention, but likely from a giant cataclysm in the very distant past. So we found the pre-dynastic center here. It was clearly devastated by some kind of ancient cataclysm. We have rich deposits of calcium carbonate, carbonate that likely came from the ocean, from flooding in from the ocean. And so the city itself is built over that way because in order to build here, they would have had, to, the dynastic people would have had to have cleared all the stone out of the area. So they found virgin territory over there and built their mud brick houses and limestone coffins and limestone edifices. But this is the megalithic core of this site. That is what may be facing us in 27 years. You need to party like crazy till then, or become strong with intense survival skills to survive the environment and any survivors. Not all stories have a happy ending. Life is like that.